giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now is able to create content thanks to viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hi, and welcome to the 2020 First Lego League Coaches Corner. I'm Patty Poston from First Nevada. I'll be your moderator. I'm a first senior mentor for First Nevada as well. We have joining with us Carrie Marsh. She's a coach for eight years now for FLL, and she is from Ohio. We also have Charles Angel. He's a coach from in FLL in South Carolina for nine years. We have Lauren Williams, a coach for FLL uh, nine years from Louisiana. And we have Ben Williams, a coach with First, FL, First Lego League for six years from Louisiana. And we're hoping to add Emily McKay. She's, Tyler's working on that as well. So she'll be joining us in a few minutes. Welcome everybody. And this is your coach's corner. This is a chance for you to ask the coaches. We do have some preset questions for them, which we are gonna start with, but feel free to add questions. And please type those in chat. Our first thing, and this is what everybody's asking me in First of Ad is the robot game. How can the students build their mission models, the robot, and attachments with social distancing or with remote only meetings? Coaches, can you help that? Well, for us, uh, the best thing is to be able to meet. Of course, it depends on your location, if they're, you're allowed to or not. Uh, we have a few things we've done uh, with meetings we've had at our school. The, uh, of course, the school district had certain policies we had to implement, such as taking temperature of anyone coming in the door, uh, wearing face masks anytime you're less than six feet from anyone. And we've actually extended that to anytime you're in the building now, you have to wear the face mask. Uh, we also have sanitation issues to deal with, like... Uh, we use a water bleach solution to clean tables. Uh, we have this cool uh, UVC LED wand we use to uh, clean Legos with. That's something we've, uh, we're still developing uh, to build a drum that we can just throw all of our loose Legos into under this UVC light that will clean and sanitize the, uh, the Legos for us overnight. Uh, so we're hoping that we can meet uh, we have talked about things to do remotely, such as with our mission models. We pretty much already built them today, but we were going to have a couple people that weren't going to come to the meetings, but now they decided to go ahead and show up. But uh, you could always give them to the parents. They could help them put it together. That's all available online, the instructions and everything. The robot is a lot tougher. That, that's something I'd like to hear what you guys think about. For several years now, my team uh, has created a robot that has a drop-on attachment system. So it uses a standard base, um, and then the kids build uh, the actual attachment off of this standard base. And we've actually, I, I'm lucky I have only uh, five kids on the team, only three families represented. And um, so we, we so far have been able to meet in person and I, I hope that we can continue that. But um, we've talked about, we could potentially build a bunch of bases and then each student could take that base home and build an attachment for the mission string that they're working on. And hopefully if you do it all right, it would all fit back together. So that's one idea to be able to be building on the same robot in different places. And I know, um, so from our standpoint, one of the things that we encourage our students to do every year is we encourage them um, just in general to use Lego Digital Designer to reconstruct um, their attachments and then the robot that they build each year. Um, so that was one other thing that we had brought up that they can use Lego Digital Designer um, to, if they don't have Legos at their house um, or available to them, they can build their attachments in Lego Digital Designer um, and model them on a robot that's in Lego Digital Designer um, and test it out kind of and see how it would fit with um, one of the mission models. Um, and then a student who had uh, Legos 
available to them could then build that attachment and then they could test it and program it um, in person. So that was one of the things that we had thought about that way as well. Those are those are great uh, suggestions. I love the the our teams have not done, used the the CAD programs, so, so we're hoping to get them more involved in that this year. Um, so I think that's part of uh, what we're looking at is we've got ten team members, so social distancing in a small classroom is is hard in the spaces that we have. Erskine College gives us um, some space to work in. Um, so what we're looking at doing, especially with whenever we have to build the mission models, is uh, we're going to send home. Uh, one to two mission models with each student, uh, and they're going to actually take those instructions and build them themselves. Um, and then we'd like for them to share that information, whether it's with a virtual meeting uh, with the rest of the team, uh, and then we'll bring them back together. Uh, so then when it comes to the robot, um, we're kind of hoping that each of those kids might take that and become the expert of that mission, uh, whether it be the scoring, uh, whether it be how that, that mission actually functions and, and works. Um, and we, um, if you have a team that has multiple robots, uh, what we're looking at is possibly rotating those robots around to team members if, if they can't meet in person. Um, and the other aspect would be that the kids will be able to have some sort of Legos at their home and they can prototype. Uh, some different attachments. So each student may be uh, focusing on certain missions and they can make a prototype that they can show how it works. Uh, and then at, at some point in that season, they're going to have to come together uh, and figure out how they're going to make this all these different prototypes work within their, their robot. But that's some of the ideas that we've got um, since we'll be working remotely some, uh, at least as a larger team. Okay, does anybody else have another question or an answer to that question? We do have two questions in chat that I'm going to break off and ask those of you guys. If you know, do either any of the coaches know when the engineering notebook or the team guide will be available on Thinkscape? Does anybody know that yet? Not yet. Mm -hmm. And the, the second question is, does anybody know when the new mat will be available on the virtual robotics toolkit? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Sorry, couldn't help you there. Let's go boys and girls. <laughs> All right, so we, we covered the robot game and let's move on to how do you program? So coaches, do you have some ideas on how students can learn the programming as well as how to program their robot and involve everybody still on the team, how to share code and how to do iterative testing? So uh, in person, it's a lot easier, of course, but uh, remotely uh, we have, our team usually builds two robots and that would be something like we were talking about earlier. You could pass around from team member to team member. And uh, we do a lot of Zoom meetings uh, to keep up with each other. And that's something where you could actually share your screen and show your code and talk about it with a coach or another team member that can help them with any problems. I know we've Skyped with other teams before whenever they ran into coding issues and we're always able to work through it with them and, and a lot of times it's not the code it's could be where they mounted their sensors to follow lines uh there are a lot of different issues you can work through on uh, skype and zoom and just as easily as you could uh face to face we actually experimented a little bit with uh having our our Lego computer down in the room where we practice and having a kid down there working on the actual physical robot and then doing some like desktop sharing where someone remotely controls the desktop. So our lead programmer is at, you know, potentially could be at his house programming on the main because everyone could work on the programming at home, but it, but you can't keep the, um, you know, you can't have one main program. So our lead programmer could be at home controlling the desktop and then he could virtually from his house, send it, Bluetooth it to the actual robot once the kid that's at the table gets it set up. And if you were on a Skype call talking the whole time you're doing it, you know, potentially you could be doing some of that. And I guess if you're working in pairs and somebody can be at the table. So we've kind of explored that. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Okay, anybody else on programming? 
long distance? Yeah, well, I know that some students might not have uh, the availability right now, but I know in our parish, our uh, county here, the uh, school board has set it up so that every student will go home with a Chromebook this year. So they'll be able to uh, get internet access. I know our charter communications here in Louisiana has also offered any student that doesn't have access to actually uh, get every student access to the internet wherever they are. So that might be available anywhere if some of your kids don't have access right now. Okay, and if, if I could just piggyback a little bit on what Kerry was uh, talking about, uh, our team last year we had uh, one student who uh, worked. Sorry, is that better? Okay. Um, and we had uh, one student who lived a little. Uh, distance away and what we ended up doing we had formed a relationship with zoom uh, zoom was happy to sponsor the uh, students on the team a um, subscription to their services and they could share their screen so we would have uh, a robot driver two robot drivers at the table that were testing the robot and then he was able to program through the zoom sharing system <laughs> and uh, earlier in the we had another session just like this and the the session brothers uh, had mentioned um, that there is a chrome extension called i believe chrome remote desktop um, and you mm -hmm. can do the same thing with that uh, so that may be a useful tool uh, to be able to share the screen and allow someone to control the, the be the lead programmer at that point okay great ideas we do have a question in chat is what if you don't have access to internet if you can get probably the Chromebook, schools are doing that, but this, the home might not have internet. Any ideas on that? It's a so, difficult one, yeah. I know, so here where we are in Louisiana, that's another one of our problems because a lot of um, our school district is a Title I school district as well. Um, so I definitely understand that pain. Um, one of the things that we've done prior to that is we have um, students who um, come and sit in school parking lots with their computers mm -hmm. um, and piggyback off of the school Wi-Fi. We have, I have personally gone to, um, you know, a McDonald's parking lot with my computer to use the internet there um, because my internet quality around here is not the best. Um, so some of the times we kind of just have to find internet that way. And then another one of the things um, that I've actually seen a team do uh, before is they invited uh, one or two students in. And I think this was a team um, in another country who still has um, some of the strict uh, coronavirus restrictions on. Um, they had uh, one student come in at a time and they sat down with their coach um, and they programmed a mission. Um, and then another student came in and they did that as well. Um, so that was another way that they could remain uh, safe together um, and still have the opportunity to continue to do what they like to do. Good answers. I know Starbucks also you can sit outside and and get off of their internet. I've done that many times. So uh, yeah, good, good, good job. Or if the libraries do open, mm -hmm. maybe you could do the library if they allow you to be socially distanced. That would be another one. All right. Any anybody else on programming on ways people can share? One additional thing, you know, another way if you want to get a student involved that can't necessarily do the programming remotely, uh, they may be able to provide some pseudocode or, you know, and communicate yeah. that to the team. So that's another way to get them involved in the process, at least, of, uh, of programming. Yeah, Charles, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, you could have a, you could have a, a, a speakerphone phone call and the kid the kid could be talking through what that robot needed to do and then someone could be at a computer typing in the the details yeah did somebody else have there we go emily um yeah i was gonna say we um we are lucky enough that we have some nice sized outdoor spaces. And um, so we're going to be looking at literally just like marking off 10 by 10 squares and sometimes having people um, 
meet like smaller groups, not the whole team necessarily, but two or three kids meet in their own little separate physical space um, to try and do some internet free programming and activities that way um, to, you know, and with, I know that with kids, it's hard to say anything in person, but we're hoping I can let you know after, after Saturday when our, <laughs> our first taped meeting um, that with, you know, physical tape on the floor, that's enough of a physical reminder um, to stay out of one another's space that, that we're going to try and make it work. Okay, very good. Anything last on programming? All right, we're going to, we're going to move forward to the next question for coaches is core values and team building. How can we build a sense of team remotely? How could you practice core values and how could you make sure everyone is engaged? One thing we did this summer, um, our high school FRC team uh, did a remote summer camp. It was a uh, NASA involved summer camp. And one way to get them involved is doing projects at home and then presenting them on a uh, chat group. And then uh, also we did games as well. There are games you could do just through Zoom, or there are actually some video games where kids can participate with each other. I know uh, I think we did that during the virtual open, FLO virtual open. That was pretty cool watching the, uh, the marble runs. Uh, but yeah, we, we do that That's with the, the kids this summer. And I think we're going to continue to do that if we have to go completely remote. Okay. Anybody else on team bonding? Um, so another one of the things that I know um, we've done in the past, um, especially this summer, was we've worked with uh, the students, uh, especially with practicing core values, um, mostly, you know, self-reflections, discussing different things like that, um, and then discussing how, you know, during this time um, right now during this pandemic, how are our core values prevalent? How um, have they seen them? Um, and then of course, you know, the reflections back on the team, like how have we done in previous years with core values? Um, what would we like to expand on? Um, and one of the things that um, the team that I um, am with is really known for is their outreach. Um, and one of the things that this year is that they've uh, discussed is how are we gonna do virtual outreach? Um, and so I know they've discussed kind of doing uh, videos and doing um, kind of like day camps that way, um, or even, you know, doing virtual events um, that they can host online and seeing if they can help other students, you know, still have the ability to gain access to this. And that's kind of brought them together thinking of um, ideas and things like that. Yeah, Lauren, I'll piggyback off of that. My team as well is a big outreach team. And interestingly, we've taken a little bit different approach. Um, I kind of told the kids, you know what, we are always doing outreach, outreach, outreach. And maybe this is the year that we turn inward a little bit. And so I'm actually we talked, uh, we met the first time this weekend, and uh, one of the things we did was we talked about our superpowers. Um, there are different apps or things that you can go through, like where the kids take a little, kind of like a personality quiz, but it identifies your superpower. And so my youngest team member who's on the wiggly side, his uh, superpower was energy. And we all laughed because that's just spot on. And so then we talked about, well, how can we incorporate energy into our team. Um, and then I challenged them. I said, I, I, I know them pretty well at this point, but I said, I have a, a character core value for each of you that you're going to work on this year. And we're going to implement that into everything we do. Um, and we're going to look at our team and maybe like kind of take a year to take uh, to reset. And, and how do we, how can we better be more effective as a team in this time when we can't do all the fun outreach and go to the air show and go to the state fair and all the things that we really like to do. So let's look inward a little bit. So that'll be another option is just make it a different kind of a year. Definitely. Some, I, I wanted to add a couple here. I recently went to the VA hospital that is in Reno, Nevada, and they're playing games with the veterans through the windows. So they're big windows outside and they're playing like tic-tac-toe. So the 
people, we were, I was, I had my dog. So it was a therapy dog thing, but the kids could go to the hospitals or VA or senior centers and bring some window chalk and play tic-tac-toe, hangman or other types of games through the windows. They'd have to get the permission, of course, but that's something you could do. We also have a business community here where you can contact businesses and maybe do virtual presentations of your team, you know, some um, engineering firms or maybe like other businesses too, just some other ideas for outreaches for you guys. Anybody else though, besides me? Um, so we have a, um, a very outreach heavy team also. It's just always been something we've enjoyed. Um, and I love the idea of reaching out to a, a senior citizen's um, home and trying to do outreach there. Um, something fun I'm gonna try and get my team <laughs> to do as a team Part of that whole, like, how do we, how do we really cement our team relationship if we're not meeting in person? Um, I'm going to try and get them to do an online Dungeons and Dragons campaign um, <laughs> because I think there's That'll a, it's a lot of fun, um, and and b, that sort of shared responsibility, thinking about your role in the group, thinking about who is the leader, all of those things. Um, I, I think, think it, it might be a really fun metaphor and. Uh, Plus, um, I, I coach my son's team, and I know he could use a little more human interaction that he's getting, so I'm hoping um, that will be the result of that. Very good. And if you have a, a new game that is my favorite right now, is called Codenames.Cards. If, and if you go there, Codenames is probably one of the best games right now for me. It does develop teamwork, team leadership, you know, listening, it develops everything that you would need for core values, I, I feel like. So we've been playing that every week and for, we're doing a weekly uh, team, team challenge, challenge now. So tonight, tomorrow night, we have two teams going to play against each other. And this could promote long distance. So if anybody would like to, we're doing, it's for FTC, but you could do that for FLL as well and just have it moderated. But Codenames is very good. Scriblio, scriblio.io is actually another good one too. If I, I, I have a plethora of games. That's all I do is play games. So. <laughs> Anybody wants those? Anybody else on outreaches or, or even, and core values bonding, team bonding? Okay, uh, we, before we move on, we had a question in chat. What would you guys think about setting up your robot board outside? What would you think of that? We've done that before in competitions, and uh, as long as the weather's fine, it's, it's not bad. The lighting can cause issues, you know, because you're going to have different lighting outside than you would inside. So if you're using your uh, reflected light intensity or your color sensor, you might get some different readings than you would inside. Um, yeah, that's actually totally what we're planning on doing. We have a portable table. Um, so we'll just be moving it in and out every time we want to meet in person um, and using that light intensity issue as an opportunity to teach them how to calibrate their, their color sensors. Yeah, the lighting might be a problem. And I know Andy Mark is supposed to be coming out with a new Lego table that's portable. So if you're looking for a new table, they haven't posted it yet, but it's supposed to be there by the end of the month. So oh, wow. that might, instead of hauling those heavy duty wood ones. Okay. Anybody else on any of those? Okay. We're going to go to the, the next topic, which is virtual tools. What virtual learning tools are you guys using or would you recommend? How do you make students sure students are engaged and are actually attending your events? And again, how do you create a sense of team? One thing we've done in this area, and we've actually done it for a while, not just COVID related, but um, the kids are all on Google Hangouts and they, they're constant. I mean, they're friends anyway, but constantly chatting. Um, we do most of our documentation on Google Docs or Google Sheets so that multiple ones can be on there. And um, I guess I don't assign a lot or I don't... Um, 
run events as much as encourage them to get on and talk to each other. Uh, we're actually doing a kickoff event tomorrow. And I, you know, we, we met today and put some stuff on paper and I said, all right, I'm, we're going to upload this to Google Docs and you guys got to finish it and fill it all in. And as long as everybody has access, then it, it's almost more self-accountability, which really with FLL is is the goal, is that the kids take ownership of it and take leadership of it. Um, and so I think some of these virtual tools where they're sharing documents and meeting together and talking often helps them really take ownership and leadership and lets me as a coach really be where I should be, which is in the background um, for support and not pushing them forward. Although, you know, <laughs> that doesn't always work. <laughs> Definitely. Good top points. And anybody else? Virtual tools? I just, I want to second the Google Docs thing. We had started that last year, actually, and it it naturally overflowed quite nicely. We had a meeting today and there was a, a kid who was like, hey, should I be taking notes in Google Sheets? And I was like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so it was nice to see them take that kind of responsibility. Um, and it's something in our school district, it's something they use in the classroom. So it's, it's nice that it's a tool they're already familiar with and not something that I'm forcing them to learn. And I know different schools use different tools. So Yeah, I would definitely talk to your school to make sure what virtual tools you can use. For example, I know in Clark County School District, they're not allowed to use Zoom or Discord. So be careful on which ones you use. If you're a community team, it doesn't matter, but uh, check your school district or your teacher will know as well. And I just for community teams, um, one of the best things is free software, um, definitely. And uh, one of the best is Google is, of course, free. And what we do is all of our students, um, if they don't have a Google account themselves, um, they have access to the Teams Google account. Um, they mm -hmm. log in through that way and they can access that as well. Um, and then, you know, then they can all get on there and do the same thing. And it's really nice to have something that's free and easily accessible for all of our students. Um, and, you know, they can they can still get onto it if they don't have a Gmail account. Anybody else? Virtual tools? Okay, we do have a question from Vicki Allen. Does anyone have an elementary team? Because she has third, fourth, and fifth graders. And some of these suggestions might be good for older kids, but maybe not necessarily for younger kids. Okay. Our community team does have some younger students. Uh, and usually we have you know, the older students are the ones going to be more familiar with Google Docs and how to use Google Forms and things. Uh, but we're also able to use the Zoom calls and things like that to get together to talk about things and talk through things. And they can submit through email, you know, any kind of uh, inputs they have. Uh, this is our first year actually going through this totally throughout the entire season. So uh, we're all kind of learning this as we go. But uh, with the virtual open we had last year, it went really well. All, all of our team members were able to watch on Twitch. Uh, we were able to do Zoom calls with them to show them what was going on. Uh, the kids, when we did our presentation, each, each student would record their parts at home and then send it in to us to put together in one large format. Uh, but as far as keeping the team together, I know that's going to be really tough to do this season. But as long as you just reach out to them and, and keep them coming together in these Zoom calls or, or Skype calls, I think it'll really help. So last year when we started with the um, using Google Sheets, I did have a team that had fourth graders on it. It, had, it was a mixed grade team of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And the fourth graders didn't seem to have a trouble they didn't have trouble keeping up with that. Um, I do think it's important, especially with younger kids, um, to focus on the fun part of this um, and making sure that they don't get too caught up in sort of the stress competitive stuff. Um, you know, just this is a great year for us all to remember, myself included, um, 
that the fun is what's important and that if this is the year where all we do is stay together as a team and have fun and learn anything, we've won. Definitely. And just to add on that, codenames.org, I did have my niece play that one, one evening, and she's 10 years old, just 10, and she actually did really well with the code names. She did have to ask us some, some of the definitions on some of them, but she was pretty good at it. So I think you could do that for 10 and up, maybe nine, nine years old if, if you want to give it a chance. But I would definitely have a coach or a parent in there to be a moderator to watch and, and help them with some of the definitions. For virtual tools, you do have to be careful. So pick a platform that has security to it. If you haven't ever heard of freeteleconference.com, that's actually a pretty good virtual platform. It, there's security, it's free. It, it's limited because it's free, but that's actually pretty good with, for the younger kids too. I actually use that for my seven and eighth grade, seven and eighth year olds that I teach virtually now. So it's a pretty good one. I think we probably all know this, but but um, I think I would just plan a lot of extra time for the kids to wave at each other and try different backgrounds. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, if I definitely. had a little kid team, and I know my when my teams were younger, it's just a lot of extra time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do love that. I my my little guys that I'm teaching writing to are you know eight, nine, and ten years old, and that's probably about. 10 minutes worth. <laughs> what did you do this week? What did you? So it's a lot of fun. Though. I have about 15 in there too. So just anybody? Yeah, well, I was just going to add in. I've got a fourth grade team that we actually just met virtually uh, a little bit before this for our own little mini kickoff. And we have a uh, fifth and sixth grade team. And they're all seem pretty adept at being able to use um, the virtual conferencing tools. Um, but I found that what we've done in our first couple of virtual meetings is we'll go over basically um, virtual meeting etiquette. Um, mm -hmm. And I think these are good opportunities mm -hmm. to teach these kids um, at this young age, you know, what are the proper ways to do it? You know, mute your microphone so that you don't have a lot of noise in the background. Um, we'll let them know um, not to talk over each other. If we go back to the core values, you know, that's a, that's a big thing. How do we include each other? We might ask and call on other, other students and that sort of thing too. Uh, but, but don't discount those fourth and fifth graders. They're, uh, they're pretty good with some of the stuff they do. I know our schools, um, they use um, Google Suite. Um, so they've got experience with Google Classroom and they, they've learned some of the basics at least. So it's a great opportunity to, to kind of push that a little bit as well. And definitely the the unmuting is important. And if you if you are in charge of the room, you can mute them too. So, but they know how to unmute. But yeah, definitely that's a good teamwork one. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking of a couple of more outreaches. Even third and fourth fifth graders can do is contact your Elks Lodge or your other business or companies like that, nonprofits in, in the area. The, it's not just Elks Lodge, but they love presentations from little kids, especially. So um, now there's Patty, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Patty, I want to just refer back to an earlier question. I just got a text from my uh, our state partner, um, and she said that it's their understanding that PDFs of the team meeting guide and the engineering notebook will be made available in the coach dashboard. So oh, that's good. What that's an earlier question. All right. Thank you. I'm glad you shared that. And we have a question for actually, this would be good for Tyler. Would you recommend setting up a video streaming camera over the board and how? Sure, I can take this a little bit. It's producer Tyler talking. So uh, as you're looking at cameras, some things to keep in mind is that many people uh, first go to a webcam and uh, there is a huge webcam shortage right now because we're all in COVID and lockdown and that sort of thing. So it is very difficult to find uh, webcams. However, uh, some things to keep in mind is that most webcams are not meant for wide angle viewing. So if you want to get like a whole table or something like that, it can look a little blurry or distorted uh, on things. But a couple of good ones to go with to give you some suggestions uh, is looking at some of the Logitech lines. Uh, for example, the C920 is a fantastic webcam uh, or C9... 
XX, pick any of the 900s past that. They are very hard to find right now because uh, once again, the webcam shortage. You can use a camcorder as well too. However, they will require some special hardware for you to actually route that into your computer. But there are some good options to do uh, for something like that. If you had an opportunity to watch the uh, VOI stream uh, that we have, this is a great example uh, of a team from Belgium uh, that use a nice overhead rigging for this. Um, all they did was uh, rig up a few two by fours, I believe. And this was a very easy way to get a nice overhead uh, viewpoint of it is. Some teams put their uh, tables on the floor so they can get a little more height and elevation. Uh, but there's a lot of great things that you can uh, do uh, for this. We'll put that back up. But to give you some examples of, you know, a few other ones that we'll show on here, uh, that overhead one was very nice. But it can be, you know, there are many different types of cameras. You look at this one uh, where it looks pretty good, but it will be a little bit distorted sometimes depending on how you look and not trying to point out this team or anything like that. But there are going to be uh, different things in regards to frame rate uh, and how you uh, run things like this as well. So just keep that in mind uh, that everyone's different. None of the webcams are meant to do what you're looking at doing specifically. Uh, so when you're looking at things, 1080p is a great thing. 30 frames per second at 1080p is some great metrics to go with something like this. So just make sure when you're looking at specs uh, that realize that, you know, you might have to play around with it a little bit to get what you need. Thank you. I hope those webcams come down in price because I know they're pretty high right now. <laughs> if worse comes to worse, you can use a phone. Some of the, I have a Pixel and it actually has a really good camera. I have a great device that I got from Amazon that is a circular light but in the middle of it, you can attach a ca uh, your phone to it or a camera, and you can position that over your table, and it actually goes up really high. So my lighting is pretty good because I have those on right now, too. Th that was like $30 off of Amazon. So those are pretty cool. for hold. That's for holding the camera and giving you light. Anybody else on programming or other things that we've talked about? Because that's our last slide. If anybody has questions, please post in the chat for our group. And I want to thank everybody for coming out and volunteering. And I wish everybody in the first Lego League world great success this year. I am excited about the hanging at the end. I can't wait to see all the robots <laughs> hanging. <laughs> That'll be really fun to watch. I think we're good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, great wrap up. This is a great year, Game Changers. <laughs> Replay, I'm excited for the year. I'm excited for the new judging as well. And again, thank you everybody for coming and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.